Hi, everybody. I realize this is a very unusual time in Shanghai. Um, I hope that you are well wherever you are. Um, we're going to try this for a little bit and let, I want your feedback on how this is going to work. I'm going to do what I usually do, and that is videotape my lectures. And I'm going to post them multiple places, so hopefully you'll be able to access them. If you can't, make sure you let me know via the WeChat or email. My plan is, and I'll, sh I'll show you the assignment sheet in just a moment, um, is that you watch the video clip, read the chapter, do the problems just on any kind of piece of paper you have, and then submit them as photographs uh, to the Dropbox each night. Now, if you can't do the Dropbox for some odd reason, you can email them to me, but it would be much easier if you would try to do the Dropbox if you can. That might mean squeezing it all on one, p one piece of paper so you can do it with one photo, but give it your best shot. Um, I'll also pose or ask a question a little bit later and probably in the WeChat group asking you where you are in the world. My goal is to have a live group chat or let you know when I will be online to help answer questions. Um, I am in Shanghai, so for those of you in relatively close time zones, no problem during the day. Uh, but for those of you who are traveling, I'll try to figure out another time. Anyway, we're moving into Chapter 8 on Rotational Equilibrium and Dynamics. Um, and this is an interesting topic. We already did a little bit of rotation in Chapter 7 when we talked about angular velocities, centripetal accelerations, and remember the Rosetta Stone with all the different topics? Well, this chapter really focuses on torque and rotational, or rotational inertia. And I'll talk more about those in just a moment. But today we'll get into a little bit of torque. Um, torque <laughs> is a real simple idea. You've all dealt with it before. If you've ever rotated a bolt or a screw, you've involved torque. Torque is the rotational equivalent of a force. Force causes things to accelerate. Torque causes things to angularly accelerate. Now you might ask, why do I have this picture of this guy here with a huge wrench? Well, to increase the torque, and we'll discover this in a moment, there's two ways of increasing the torque. One is to increase your applied force. The other one is to increase the distance from the pivot point to where you're applying the force, oftentimes called the radius. Making either one of those two things larger increases the amount of torque. And thus, the large wrench could produce a very large torque. Also, turn a large bolt. Here's the definition of torque. If you remember, torque is represented by the Greek letter tau. Um, where F is the force, R is the distance from the pivot point to the location where the force is applied, usually the radius, and the units for torque are newton meters, because force is in newtons, R is in meters, and theta is the angle between these two. In this previous example, that angle is 90 degrees, but it doesn't have to be. So here's a quick conceptual question. You want to turn a stubborn screw. That's a screw that doesn't want to rotate. You've got a choice of either a short, stubby screwdriver or a long screwdriver with a thin handle. You can see the handle is a little bit smaller. I'll give you five seconds. I want to ask you which one would be better to turn a tough screw? And the answer is, believe it or not, the short screw. Why? Uh, because, because of the wide handle, the bigger R here creates a larger torque with the same amount of force than this handle over here, which has a much smaller R with the same force. Now, on the other hand, if you were trying to pry the, the lid off of a can, then yes, uh, the longer one would be better, because now the pivot point's here, but you're trying to pull off this lid. Sorry, hard to draw a lid. Um, but now the radius would be this distance here, the length of the screwdriver, if you're applying a force down this way to try to pop the lid off over here. Um, yes, then this one would be better. But for turning a screw, the wide, bigger handle is more important. Um, so now the direction of torque is the other part. You know how to calculate the magnitude. That's just the force times r times the sine of theta. But it turns out, just like force, torque is also a vector quantity, which means it has both, both magnitude and direction. And it involves something called a cross product. 
And excuse me for a moment as I go live. Please excuse this brief live interruption, but I need to use my right hand to show you this next part. So up here you see the equation for torque we've been using. Torque is equal to force times the radius, that's the distance from the pivot point to where the force is applied, times the sine of the angle. But I want to show you the more exact form of the formula. This one, torque is actually a vector. Just like force is a vector, it has both magnitude and direction. Um, and it's equal to the cross product between the radius and the force vector. You might say, well, wait a second, what's a cross product? Well, there's two ways of multiplying vectors. One is a dot product, you might have learned in math, and the other one's a cross product. The cross product is where you actually do a little bit of work. You'll need your right hand to solve this one. Now, before we do that, just a quick reminder, in AP Physics, we define towards the right as positive x, up as positive y, and positive z is coming out of the page at you. Remember I, last time I showed you a little circle with a dot in it? Here's another way of looking at it. So how does the cross product work? It's very, very simple. You take your right hand, and it's got to be your right hand. Don't get the wrong one. Um, and here's what you do. Since r is the first component in this vector, the first thing you do is take the palm of your hand and point it in the direction of the r vector. So from the pivot point towards where the force is applied, this way. Now, if and only if you can bend your fingers easily in the direction of the force vector, your thumb points in the direction of the torque vector. So in this case, r cross f points in the positive z direction, out of the page. If you try bending your fingers the other way, unless you're double jointed, it will cause pain. Then you know you're doing the cross product incorrectly. So R cross F positive Z. So what happens in the other direction? Well, if you had, for example, the wrench on this side and you're pulling down on it, you discover very quickly that doing the cross, cross product this time pointing your right hand palm in the direction of the radius, you're going to have to put your palm this way so you can easily move your fingers this way. And this time, my thumb is pointing into the page in the negative z direction. And so what does this mean? This torque pointed in the positive z direction. And so typically what we do is we say that these kind of torques, which would rotate this bolt, bolt counterclockwise, is a positive torque because the torque vector points in the positive z. So things that rotate when you're looking at the page in a counterclockwise direction is positive torque. And things that would tend to rotate this bolt in the clockwise direction are considered negative torques. Why? Because the torque vector, r cross f, points in the negative z. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. All right, quick review. <laughs> Sorry for my uh, casual look, but uh, yeah, I'm at school. I'm the only one here, so I'm in T-shirts. I'll take a quick look at it. Quick reminder then. So if you've got this kind of situation where the bolt would tend to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, we say that's a positive torque because the torque vector is pointing out of the page at you in the positive Z direction. Remember, positive z. And over here, if you, this would tend to rotate this bolt or clockwise. And clockwise torques, we say, are negative because the torque is pointing in the negative z direction. I'm going to try and use that little quick little trick to do that. All right, hopefully you got that. Hopefully I didn't mess it up too badly. So quick reminder, we already talked about this. Clockwise torques point into the page and defined as negative. Counterclockwise torques point out of the page, and the positive z defined as positives. Torques can be calculated by taking the perpendicular component of the distance of the force, i.e., sometimes called the lever arm. And let me explain what that means. So you have this equation, or I'll pause and go to the next slide. So you already have this equation. Uh, you know that torque is equal to force times r, times the sine of theta. Now, here's the interesting part. If the force is acting out this direction, you can actually work backwards along that line, do a little dotted line back here. And when you do that, you can figure out, here's my pivot point. 
you can figure out this distance right here. Um, excuse my really bad drawing. Where this distance is exactly perpendicular to the line along the force. And this distance is sometimes called D. And if you look at this little triangle right here, this is a right triangle, the sine of theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Or you can rewrite it very quickly that D is equal to R times sine theta. And you should say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, R sine theta, oh yeah, R sine theta. Uh, which means you can simply rewrite this torque as F times D. Now again, remember, this is just the magnitude of the torque. doesn't give us the direction, just the magnitude. So instead of doing R times the force times the sine of this angle, the angle between this. Oh, by the way, you can either use this angle here or you can use this angle here or you can use this angle here. All of them, believe it or not, will give you the same answer. The sine of this angle is equal to the sine of this angle um, is equal to the sine of this angle. Um, but instead of doing force times radius times the sine of one of these thetas, you can simply do r, or sorry, force times the perpendicular distance between the pivot point and the line of action of the force. So this working rock back this way. And you might say, I don't like this way. I, I prefer the other way. Well, let me show you where it comes in handy. Oh, I've got a little notes here. Um, so for non-perpendicular forces, you can either do force times R times the sine of the angle, or you can find, like in this case here, if you work backwards along this line, and please forgive me if I don't get it exactly straight, you could figure out the perpendicular distance right here, where this length right here is D, and you could just take D times this force, or you can take R times the force, times the sine of the angle between those. Um, this component of the force, just why we always use the sine part, is think about it real quick. The reason we're only interested in this vertical component of the force is because this is the one that's actually going to cause the twist on the bolt. This force here, this component, this horizontal component, only has a tendency to pull the wrench away from the bolt. It doesn't have any tendency at all to tend to rotate it. Now, uh, some quick calculations, and I promise no calculator required. Um, so how do you calculate the torque? Well, in this case, super trooper tr easy. Um, in this case, the force is exactly perpendicular to the radius vector. How do you calculate the torque? Well, the torque is going to be equal to R F times R. This is the magnitude of the torque times the sine of the angle. In this case, the torque is going to be 100 newtons times the distance in meters, 0 0.2 times the sine of 90, which of course, remember, is equal to 1. And so what's my torque? It's 20 newton meters. Now, trick question, positive or negative? Well, if you do the cross product, R cross F, you should discover that this force will tend to rotate the bolt counterclockwise, which means this is a positive torque. If you do the cross product, the cross product points in the positive z-axis. All right. Um, what about this one? So this one, and you can measure the angle here. This angle here is supposed to be 30 degrees. You can either use 30 degrees or you can use 150 degrees, this angle here. Or you can even use, heaven forbid, uh, 210 degrees. Um, and we're interested in that, and you might remember, of course, that the sine, let's do the easiest angle, 30 degrees. So what's the torque in this case? Uh, torque is equal to F times R times sine of theta. In this case, it's going to be 100 newtons times 0 0.2 meters times the sine of 30, which, of course, is 1 half. What's the answer to this one? The answer is it's going to be 10 newton meters. And again, positive, because it's going to tend to rotate the boat counterclockwise from our perspective. What about this one? In this case, the angle between R and the force is 180 degrees. So the torque is going to be the force, 100 newtons, times the distance, 0 0.2, times this, well, that's a really bad 2, times the sine of 180 degrees. Some of you know this or can see it immediately, but... 
If you don't, sine of 180 degrees is zero. What's the torque in this case? It's just zero newton meters. Why? This force won't actually produce a torque. You can see either logically or conceptually or mathematically knowing that that's true. So now, you were looking at fixed bolts before. Is there going to be a torque on the soccer ball? So if you're kicking, and this is a little bit of soccer, I know soccer season should have started, sorry. Um, but what happens if the force is applied like this? Where does a ball or an object rotate around? Well, the answer is it always rotates around its center of mass. Remember, center of mass is the average location of the mass of an object. And for a soccer ball, unless it's oblong, it should be right in the center. So what if you kick it right along a line that goes through the center? What's the torque that's going to be generated? And the answer is zero. Why? If you think about it, what's the perpendicular distance between this line of force and the pivot point? In other words, what's D? And you'll discover in this case, D is zero. So the torque, which we could either calculate using force times R times the sine of theta, or by using force times the lever arm D, you'll discover the torque in this case is zero. What's going to happen to our ball? It's going to accelerate this direction, but it's not going to angular accelerate. It's not going to rotate because there's no torque. On the other hand, what happens if you kick it a little bit below here? Well, now that force is acting along this line right here. Please excuse my really bad drawing. And in this case, yeah, there is a D right here. This is the perpendicular distance between that line of force. And sure enough, this is going to generate a torque. And it's going to begin to rotate the ball this direction. You can calculate the torque either by taking the force times the length of the lever arm D, or you could have also worked out the radius vector between this and here, and the angle between the two, theta, and done R times F times the sine of theta, which is a little bit more painful sometimes, I think, than just doing force times lever arm D. But both will give you the right answer. Um, this one I like. It's kind of a difficult one. Um, you've got all of these forces acting on uh, this cube where the center of mass is sitting right here. I guess it's kind of a, a two-dimensional cube. <laughs> Maybe it's not. Two-dimensional square, not a cube. <laughs> the center of mass, which in this case they label CM, is right here in the center. Um, and the question is, out of all these forces, F sub A, F sub B, F sub C, D, E, F, G, and H, which one of these can produce the largest torque on this square? And you might say, well, wait, how am I supposed to solve this? I didn't, didn't give me any distances. In this case, it's the lever arm that will actually save you. Think about it for a brief moment. Look at force A. Its line goes right through the center of mass. What's the distance or the lever arm between that? The answer is zero. Um, look at B, look at C, and now look at D. D's lever arm is this distance right here. This would be D, <laughs> D's lever arm. So that's generating some torque. E's lever arm is from here to that, whoops, to that line of force. I'll try my better line. Uh, sorry, that's really bad. This is the lever arm for this force down here. This one here would have a lever arm like this, perpendicular. And G would have a lever arm that would look like this. And H wouldn't have a lever arm because it goes right through there. So which one produces the greatest torque? The answer is F sub E. Why? It has the greatest lever arm, D, between the pivot point and where the force is applied, perpendicular to that line. Um, oh, which of the five? Oh, sorry, I actually answered this one first. This one's going to generate a torque, the largest torque. Which one generates torque? Well, remember, A does not, B does not, C does not. So F sub D does generate a torque. F sub E we know generates a torque. Um, F sub F generates a torque. And oh, I'm going to run out of space. And F sub G generates a torque. F sub H does not because it has no lever arm. Okay. All right. Oops, I got answers on here too. 
Um, center of mass. We've worked with this before. Remember when you tried to lift the bowling ball against the wall uh, where the ladies uh, embarrass the guys? Um, center of mass is the average location of the mass of an object or a system of masses. So a center of mass may not be actually located inside of an object. So where's the center of mass of each of the following objects? For this object here, it's right at the center. For this ob for the sphere, it's right at the center. And for this object here, it's going to be a little challenging. I think its center of mass is probably right around here. And you might say, whoa, how can you even calculate that? Well, if you divide it along this axis first, remember we actually did a little bit of work on this mathematically, we need to make sure we have the same amount of mass up here as we have down below here. Actually, I think I messed up a little bit. And if we divide it along this line here, we should have the same amount of mass on the left side of that as we have on the right side. Hmm. I think I did pretty well left to right, but it probably the center mass of this thing's probably closer to here than down here. Please notice center mass can actually be at a point where there is no mass, ironically. Um, mathematically, remember, you can actually define it this way. Um, you can find it experimentally by just balancing the object on a pivot point. And if it balances, it means you've got equal amounts of mass on this side and this side. Um, mathematically, the total mass times the distance center mass is equal to m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2 plus m3 times x3, yada, yada, yada. Or you can just do the sigma notation, the sum of all those pieces. All right. Um, we'll come back to center of mass in just a little bit, but it's a quick reminder on it. What if you have two forces acting on the same object? How do you solve this one? So here's our pivot point. And what's the torque due to this? All right, let's do this one first, due to F1. Well, the torque here would be the force times R times the sine of theta. So in this case, that torque is 8 newtons. Now be careful on the distance. It's 3 meters over to where the other force is, another 2 meters here, times 5 times the sine of 90 degrees. That's the angle between R and that. So we end up with 40 newton meters. Positive or negative is my question. Will this force, relative to this pivot point, tend to rotate this thing clockwise or counterclockwise? And if you thought about, if this force was acting by itself, it would tend to rotate this thing clockwise, which means this is a negative torque. What about the torque due to this one? Well, the torque due to this one is going to be the force, 12, times the distance from the pivot point, 2 meters, times the sine of 30 degrees. The sine of 30 degrees, again, 1 half, which means this torque is going to be 12 newton meters. Positive or negative? If you had only this pivot point and only this force acting on it, it would tend to rotate this beam counterclockwise, which, remember, is a positive torque. So what's the net torque, the sum of these torques around here? Well, the net torque is going to be the sum of these two. Negative 40 plus 12 gives us negative 28 newton meters. Hopefully that makes some sense. Good. I've got the answer on this. Oh, shoot, a brain break, but you're not here. Uh, all right. You can try this on your own, but pause the video, see if you can figure it out. Each one of these can be completed with, oh, with a chemistry term, which makes it kind of work. Let me quick explain. I hope the carpenter will compound this nail to the wall. Compound. The wrestler had one knee on the mat. Can put over the word neon. So let me give you one quick hint. I can figure this one out. Number one, the days of the past blank forever. And I'm pretty sure the answer on this one is argon. Yes, I know, it's a horrible pun. If you want to solve the rest of these, pause it. If not, I'll show you the answer in five, four, three, two, one. Boom. So there you have it. At least you got a little brain break. Uh, by the way, this one, um, I don't know who Jerry was. I can't remember the candidate. But the, the person who won the election in 1980 was Ronald Reagan, so elect Ron. Yeah, this one, by the way, drove me crazy. When you hear a moan, you scream. Yeah, go figure.
All right. So equilibrium. So <laughs> we've studied torques already. We know what to do. We know how to figure out direction. You know how to figure out magnitude. But how do you figure out or how do you reach equilibrium? Equilibrium means that the net torque has to be zero. Um, so in this case, let's make gravity 10 real quick. So in this case, the force of gravity on this person's 1,000 newtons. Excuse, excuse my very bad one. So the torque generated due to this person will be that force times that distance. Hopefully you're pretty comfortable at this point. 1,200 newton meters. And it's going to rotate it in a counterclockwise direction so it's positive. If I want this thing to balance, in other words, be in rotational equilibrium, I need the torque generated by the smaller child to be negative 1,200 newton meters. So the same magnitude torque, this torque is trying to rotate it this way. I need this person's torque to try to rotate it this way, clockwise. If the force of gravity on them is 400 newtons, please excuse a really bad drawing, What's this distance have to be? What does R have to be to make this thing work? And most of you can just sort of eyeball and say, oh, duh, it has to be three meters. So on this seesaw or teeter-totter, it would reach equilibrium if you had the smaller child standing further away. And you might remember this back from when you were a young child back in the playground. You're like, oh, yeah, of course that worked. All right, moving on. Let's make it just a little bit more complex. Same person, same adult over here, 1,000 newtons over here, but now you've got two children. How do you solve this one? Oh, by the way, this child is 1.2 meters. That's all the way over from the center. I just couldn't figure out a way to draw that. Uh, both of them are 40 kilograms, which means this is 400 newtons and 400 newtons. Where do you put the adult in this case? So solving this one real quick, you can very quickly realize that the torque on this child is negative 320 newtons, meters, just 400 times 0.8, negative because it's going to try to rotate it clockwise. And this one is going to be 400 times 1.4. The torque due to this child is negative 480 newton meters. So the total torque in this direction, total clockwise torque, is negative 800 newton meters. Which means to balance this, I need the torque due to this adult to be positive 800 newtons. So that their torque trying to rotate it this way balances out their torques trying to rotate it clockwise. And very quickly you can realize, oh, okay, the distance here is going to have to be 0 0.8 meters because that distance times this force will give us, that's 800, believe it or not, <laughs> that much torque. <laughs> so when we talk about equilibrium, we're actually, I sort of cheated you up to this point. Not only does the net torque have to be zero, but also the net force has to be zero, which means that the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction have to be zero, and the sum of the forces in the y direction have to be zero. Both these conditions have to be met if you are truly in equilibrium. Now, I've got to mention just real quick, you might say, oh, okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. Yeah, um, I'll tell you about one of my least favorite undergraduate courses. It was a course called Statics. It was a one-semester course that was mandatory for every science major and for all engineering majors who were doing either civil engineering or architecture, and it was also required for architects. And you might say, wait, what is, what's this all about? Well, believe it or not, the entire one semester course just looked at cases and cases of equilibrium. And you might say, what? Yeah, every single problem, the net force and the net torque were zero. Why would you want to have a civil engineer or an architect do this? Well, believe it or not, uh, you actually want bridges and buildings not to either angularly accelerate or to linearly accelerate. You actually want them to be in equilibrium. So I guess it's an important course. I found it was one of the most boring courses ever because nothing ever changed. Everything was stationary, but a requirement. <laughs> you you, some of you may end up in that course. Don't let me bias you. It probably will be wonderful. <laughs> All right. So take a quick look at this one. 
So for something to be in equilibrium, the net force has to be zero and the net torque. So take a look at this crate. Here's, I've got a 500 newton act force acting downward, and I've got a 500 newton force acting upward. Aha! It's in equilibrium, right? The net force is zero. Well, there's a small problem here. If you work along, again, the line of that force, you can figure out the lever arm here is 0 0.5 meters to the pivot point, which would be at the center of mass. And the lever arm for this side is also 0.5 meters. Um, and in this case, the two torques don't cancel. This force tends to rotate it clockwise, and this torque tends to rotate it clockwise. What's the net torque? Well, the torque to this one, is, this force down here is 500 times 0.5, or negative 250 newton meters. Why negative? Because it wants to rotate it clockwise. And the torque due to this force is also negative 250 newton meters. So what's the net torque in this case? The net torque is actually negative 500 newton meters. And this object is not in equilibrium. What's going to do? It's just going to spin in place. It's not going to accelerate up or down, left or right. It's just going to spin around its center of mass. Um, I was supposed to do this demo for you, and I didn't do a video this time. But what you have here is a force probe, and you'll discover something very interesting. If you, for example, this is a 0 0.1 kilogram mass, which means the force of gravity on it, multiplied by 10, is about 1 newton. If it's hanging here, this is the pivot point. Do you want to guess what the tension would have to be here for this thing to be in equilibrium? Well, if you think about it, this is two units away. I'll call these each one unit. And some of you can probably guess already. If I call each one of these one unit, the torque generated by this one would be 2 times 1. 2, and I won't put units on it because I don't know. These are definitely not meters. <laughs> um, 2, and it's rotating in the counterclockwise direction, so positive 2. This thing's in equilibrium. What does the tension have to be here so that this thing's balancing if this is one unit away from the pivot point? And most of you can figure out it would have to be two newtons to generate a torque that was n negative to one unit times two. This is going to tend to rotate in the, in the clockwise direction. That's hard to draw. Whoops, sorry, my bad. Rotating that way. This one would tend to rotate it counterclockwise. And if I moved it out here, um, this force would jump to three. If I moved the mass out to the last one over here, where it was four units away and removed it here, this would read, let's see, make sure, one, two, three, four. This would read four newtons over here on this force probe because the tension here is the same as the tension down here. Okay? Oh, <laughs> this was going to be one of your worksheets. Um, I don't know if you ever had to make a mobile. That's where you've got a bunch of things hanging from rods, hanging from strings, hanging from the ceiling, and they're all free to rotate, but they're all balanced. Um, Calder, an artist, used to do large mobiles. Uh, there's some in the bottom of the former Sears Tower in Chicago. Uh, but let me just walk you through this one real quick. To make this work, we need to suspend each one of these rods so that it balances. And this is our bottom rod. Where are we going to have to suspend it from? Well, from point B. So if we hung this from a string right here, we've got two units, one unit of mass, two units, one unit of mass. It would balance. Now the key here is where can I hang this whole rod from the next rod so that it balances? I already have a two kilogram mass connected right here, and now this whole thing weighs two kilograms. We'll assume the rods have no mass. And most of you are like, oh, duh, you just need to put it right here. Think about it for a brief moment. If I put a string between here and here, I now have two kilograms hanging from this point right here. Remember, this whole thing is two kilograms. And if I suspended it from point F, it would balance two units, two kilograms one unit away, and two kilograms one unit away on the other side. So now this whole thing weighs four kilograms. Two from the rod below plus the two here. Where could I hang four kilograms from this next rod 
so that it balances with the two. And this time I can't just put it in a die because if I put four kilograms here and put a string right here, it definitely would not balance. And you're like, wait, this is impossible. Well, think about it for a brief moment. I'll give you two or a few seconds. Where could I put it? The answer is over here at H. And now I've got four kilograms here, two kilograms here. You're like, that, that won't balance. It will if I put the pivot point or hang it from a string that's right here. Why? I've got four, one unit away, and two, two units away. So now this whole thing is four plus two is six kilograms. And you might have already figured out the trick. Where could I hang six kilograms from this next rod so that it balances with two? And you could probably figure out, oh, wait a second. I need to suspend this one so the two kilogram is three units further away than the six. So I need to hang this string over here. I've got six kilograms here, one unit away two kilograms, three units away from the pivot point, and it will balance. And now the last step. All the bottom of this thing weighs eight kilograms. Where can I hang it from this one so that it would balance? And you might say, okay, let's put it between here. No, there's no way that's going to balance. Um, can't put it here. Could put it here, but then the string, if I put it there, wouldn't balance. Definitely not there. Let's try putting it over here. If I put it there and suspended it from there, this gets a little bit more complex. The torque eight times one unit has to equal two times one unit plus two times three units. Ah, six plus two is equal to eight times one. And yes, believe it or not, this whole thing would balance if I suspended it from point Q. I guess, whoops, I should have connected it here, this little hook. Sorry, my bad. There. And this whole thing would balance. Um, you could do this one. I'm going to skip this one because we did a similar one a moment. Oh, a brief commercial interruption. Physics Bowl. <laughs> Every year, uh, the American Association of Physics Teachers offers the Physics Bowl. Um, and there's two different divisions. Division one is for students taking physics for the first time, even if it's the first course, is AP Physics one. And division two is for anyone taking a second or more courses in physics or anyone wishing a challenge. So I want to just quickly give you an example of the questions. And yes, I, I'll have you sign up for this if you're interested. It's free. Um, if you do well, you get bragging rights. Uh, they do not offer cash prizes. I'm so sorry. But you can definitely put it on your college rec. <laughs> um, it, you can do it online, and I'll help you with that when we, get, we figure out what's happening with this one. So I want to give you some quick examples of questions. Which of the following choices correctly to, represents a length of three millimeters? And you can very quickly go, oh, wait a second. Yeah, that's uh, millimeters one, one thousandth of a meter, so it would be B. A box uniformly slides that long to rest across a flat surface in the time of that. What was the initial speed of the box when it started to slide? And you might say, whoa, wait a second. How do you solve this one? Um, in this case, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, you can figure out the average velocity, the distance divided by the time. And then you know the final velocity is zero. The initial velocity would be double the average, uh, which I can't solve in my head fast enough. And then look at number three, which of the following is not a vector quantity? Um, force is a vector, acceleration is a vector, momentum is a vector, velocity is a vector. The one that's not a vector, of course, is speed. So you can see they're not impossible, but time is a consideration. You're going to be doing 40 multiple choice questions in 45 minutes. That's a little bit over one minute per each one. I'll send out a Google poll if you're interested, or you can send me an email as well. All right, moving on. Um, Last thing on this one, we've been working with pivot points a little bit. Um, just a quick note, torques require a point of reference, a pivot point. That's where we measure the radius vector from. But here's the weird thing, pivot points can be anywhere, as long as you use it, the same pivot point for all the torques. So you choose a pivot point to make the problem the least difficult. So take a look at this one. We're trying to find the tension in the cable over here, and the question is, is 
where's the best place to put the pivot point if I'm trying to solve this tension? I know the force of gravity on this is going to be 1,200 newtons. Um, and the beam here has no mass. Well, pretty easy. You can sort of say, all right, let's put the pivot point here. Why? Um, if you haven't thought about it already, the pivot point, or there must be a normal force acting upward on this side. This triangle thing, the pivot point over here, has to produce some sort of force hold up this side of it. Um, but if I put the pivot point here, there's a nice advantage. Sorry, I shouldn't do blue on blue. Um, by putting the pivot point there, I don't need to worry about that normal force. Why? Uh, if you think about it, that normal force, its line of action right along this way, is producing no torque relative to that point, which means I can solve the equilibrium without knowing that force. How do I solve it? Um, I can quickly calculate the torque due to the, uh, this mass right here. It's going to be 1,200 times 3, uh, negative 3,600 newton meters, which means I need the torque due to this tension to be positive 3,600 newtons meters. Sorry. I'm already thinking the answer. Um, it's four meters away, this tension over here. So what does the tension need to be? The tension needs to be 900 newtons. Hopefully you can see that. 3,600 divided by the four gives us that. Um, the final question then, though, is what's the force that the pivot point must provide? And you might say, whoa, how am I supposed to know this? Well, we know the system's in equilibrium. We have, which means the net torque has to be zero. We already calculated that and did that. But also the net force has to be zero. We've got 1,200 newtons acting downward, and the tension's only 900 newtons acting upward. What does this normal force have to be? The answer is, you can very quickly realize, oh, this has to be 300 newtons. And now, these two upward forces balance this downward force. This is an equilibrium. And so the tension in the cable, 900 newtons. The normal force produced by this little triangle right here has to be 300 newtons. Some of you say, wait a second, why is it larger on this side than that side? Because this mass is located closer to this edge of the beam. Um, here are the two answers you would have gotten if you had used 9.8 for these. It's fine with 10. So this next one, what happens if I make it just a little bit more interesting? What happens if, there, if the beam has a mass of 20 kilograms? First question is, where do you put that 20 kilograms? And some of you already immediately know it. It's got to be at the center of mass. So we pretend that is located right here. And so the force of gravity on the center of mass would produce 200 newtons. Where is it located? If this beam is 4 meters long, this has to be 2 meters over from this triangle. So now our torques get a little bit more interesting. The torque due to the weight of the board, 200 times 2, negative 400 newton meters. And by the way, making gravity 10 again. And we've got the force of gravity acting on this one, which is a 1,200 newtons, times 3 meters, which means the torque here is negative 3,600 newton meters, the same as it was before. Negative for both these because it would tend to rotate it clockwise relative to this pivot point. Sorry, I made the assumption that it was there. What's the tension going to be in the cable this time? Um, Total torque due to these two is 4,000 newton meters clockwise, which means we need the torque due to this tension over here to be positive 4,000 newton meters, hopefully not going off the edge of my screen. So what's the tension have to be? And most of you can see it already. This tension has to be, in this case, 1,000 newtons. Finally, though, what's this normal force going to be? Think about it for a brief moment before you answer. Total downward forces is, is 1,400 newtons. We have 1,000 acting upward. This normal force here has to be 400 newtons. All right. 
And again, if you had used 9.8, you would have ended up with close answers, just slightly different. All right. We're almost done. Um, what happens if I don't put a pivot point in? In this case, there's two tensions. There's a tension here, which I'll call it tension on the left, and a tension over here, a tension on the right. And you might say, well, wait a second. Why didn't you draw on the same length? Well, this mass is closer to this side, so I'm going to assume that this tension's a little bit larger. And my question is, what's the tension in the right cable? So trying to solve this one first. You might say, whoa, this is impossible. We have two unknowns. Okay, this goes back again to what we were talking about before. Let me put the center of mass back in here. You can put the pivot point anywhere you want. And because we're trying to solve for this unknown and not this unknown, if I put the pivot point right below there, I don't need to worry about the torque generated by this tension or force because it's, it's right along this line going through the pivot point. Um, very quickly, the torque due to this one is going to be negative 400 newton meters because we know it's two meters away from that pivot point. The torque due to this mass, please forgive me for not drawing the whole thing, is 3,600 newton meters. And for some of you, you can very quickly realize, wait a second! Total clockwise torque is 4,000 newton meters, which means this has to generate a torque of 4, 000, or positive 4,000 newton meters, which means if it's four meters away, it has to be 1,000 newtons, the same as it was before. Yes, believe it or not, if you look at it, this situation is identical to before, except for the fact that I took out the, the triangle here and put another rope which means most of you can sort of figure it out real quick. The total downward force, 200 plus 1,200, there's a total of 1,400 newtons acting downward. What does this tension have to be? The answer is it has to be 400 newtons so that the sum of these two upward ten or tensions are equal to the total force of gravity on these two objects downward. And if you had used 9.8, you would end up with those two. But I'm quite happy with our tens. We've been dealing with ropes and beams. What happens if we're dealing with a bridge? So a lot of bridges are designed this way. Let me put the mass on it. So this suspension part right here is 8,000 kilograms, and it'd be right in the center. And each of these supports, the one on the right here is producing a normal force. Uh, oh, sorry for my really bad arrow. And this one over here is producing a normal force as well. And the question is, what's each one of these? And we want to find the right support first. Hint, let's put a pivot point right here. Why? Because now I don't need to worry about this force at all. Solving this one, we have 80,000 newtons. Oh, sorry. That's really messy. And that's four meters over. So the torque due to the weight, 80,000 times four. 3,200 newton meters. And of course, negative because it's clockwise. And the torque to the car, this is going to be 12,000 newtons. And it's five meters away from this pivot point. So the torque to this one is going to be. Wait a second, just make sure I've got it right. Oh, 60,000 newton meters. Which means the total torque right now is negative 380,000 newton meters. Which means I need the torque, whoops, sorry, the torque due to this one right here to be positive 380,000 newton meters. So, solving this one. Um, if you take that and divide it by this length, 8, we can figure out what that has to be. So please forgive me for a brief moment as I solve this on my calculator. And you should as well. And you should discover that, that to make this work, to reach equilibrium, to produce a net torque of 0, the force on this right-hand pillar 
has to be 47,500 newtons. And that'll generate this torque, which will balance these two torques, the sum of those two. We could do the same trick, by the way, to find, we could put the pivot point here to solve this one. We could, by removing it here, um, but we know that the total upward force, the sum of these two, has to equal the total downward force. The total downward force is n the sum of these two, 92,000. So I can very quickly subtract and discover that the force on the left-hand pillar, normal force, has to be 44,500 newtons. And you'll discover that the sum of those two is the 9,200 newtons that we need, or 92,000 newtons. And then that torques are zero as well. If you had used 9.8, you would end up with very close answers to these, um, but slightly different. All right? Good. Um, one quick biological question. Take a quick look here. The question is, is what force do your biceps exert? Assuming your force that your bicep exerts right, is right here, your pivot point is your, is your elbow, how much force does your biceps need to exert if you're lifting up this ball? And the answer is, it's, it's surprisingly large. Um, the torque due to this ball is 50 times the distance, 0.35, times the sine of 90. Uh, assuming that angle here is 90 degrees. And that's got to be balanced by this torque, which is this force times this distance. If you grab your calculator real quick, you'll discover that, first of all, 50 times 0.35. Um, this torque here is negative 17.5 newton meters, which means we need the torque due to this force, which we're trying to solve, to be positive. 17.5 newton meters. Um, and dividing that by the r, the distance, which in this case is only 0 0.03, wow. Um, you'll discover that your biceps in this case have to produce a force of about 583 newtons, not to the right number of sig figs, but you get, I, you get the idea. And you might say, whoa, wait a second. Why, why, why are we designed this way? To lift up this 50 Newton object, I have to apply that force? And the answer is, yeah, it, it would be much easier if our biceps were connected out here by our wrists. <laughs> why aren't they? Um, yes, we could lift much heavier objects, but what could we not do? We would have a very limited range of motion. And yes, our arms would look pretty weird. They look like wings. Um, what's the advantage here? We get a huge range of motion. Our arms can go all the way from here, all the way down to here, and some of yours further. Um, we get a huge range of motion because our muscles can't stretch that far. Um, and if you put them out here, we'd only have a range of motion maybe from here <laughs> to here. <laughs> all right. Oh, good. Got the right answer. Uh, some qu quick conceptual questions, not a really tough one. Um, oh, whoops, uh, it's a math one. Here's the conceptual ones. So let's say we have a bunch of problems like this, and I just want you to sort of think about it real quick. Um, I've got a, a beam here that has a weight. It has a mass tied to it. And it's got these points here where this rope is attached and point A where the other rope is attached. If I was trying, if I knew the this, I knew the weight of the, I lost my pen. If we knew this force here, and we knew the weight of the box, and I was trying to find this left force here, where should I put the pivot point? And the answer is, of course, right here, because that way I can ignore this tension while I'm solving this one. And so these are the conceptual ones. So in this case, the answer would be D. What if in this case, what if I, was, was, I knew these two tensions, and I was trying to find this, but I didn't know this. Where should I put the pivot point to solve it? And the correct answer here would be underneath C, so I could ignore this force and still be able to solve it. Remember earlier I told you you could put the pivot point wherever you wanted, just as long as you were consistent with it. Once you put it there, you had to solve everything, all the torques around that point. What if I knew 
this one and this one. I didn't know the left, but I was trying to find the right. And most of you at this point would be pretty obvious, like, oh, well, if I need to do that, put the pivot point there. And then finally for this last one, I'll let you think about it for a moment. If I was trying to find the weight of the box and I knew the two tensions, where I should I put the pivot point? And the answer, of course, should be under B. Good. Oh, last one. I know. Oh, that's right. Okay, everybody. Um, let's end there. Uh, it's been a long enough lecture. Uh, give the homework a try tonight. It, uh, make sure you take a look at the chapter, just the sections on it. Um, and again, just submit those um, as a single photograph um, or scan or PDF uh, to the Dropbox. We're going to count your homework as a lab grade this chapter because we're not going to be able to do a lab. Um, again, if you have questions on it, be feel, or ask me via either WeChat or email, whichever is most convenient. God's blessings wherever you are in the world, and uh, hopefully I will see you soon. Bye-bye.